Uh, um, so I guess I should ask first, are there questions about the assignment, things I didn't get to last time or something like that? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to start on all the stuff that I should have talked about last time I didn't get to. <laughs> and then uh, because the new material also has some really important things in it, I'm just kind of uh, resigned to the fact that I'm not going to finish that and I'm still going to be behind at the end of the lecture, but hopefully I'll catch up eventually. All right. So anyway, um, um, I'm going to start with this. Um, so Popper's worry about conventionalism and basically also about naturalism um, is that uh, these really amount to proposed methodologies for empirical science, but they're bad methodologies. Um, they're bad methodologies if empirical science, that is the thing we're trying to understand here, is a thing that makes progress, right? And that, like, I think based on the things I said at the beginning of the course, you can understand why, you know, it, it makes sense for him to assume that what we, want, what we want to understand here is this human institution that makes progress in a certain way. Um, and these methodologies, because they um, end up one way or another being like committed to the current scientific theory being true, uh, you know, can't really explain that. Um, so, right as he says, this is in chapter two, section nine, on page twenty-eight. Um, um, that um, counts itself against, I guess, those, this is at the end of the first paragraph there, who regard it as their task to analyze the characteristic ability of science to advance and the characteristic manner in which a choice is made in crucial cases between conflicting systems of theories. So, um, so we want, uh, an understanding of understanding it. We want a methodology that could be used as the methodology of something that advances and chooses between theories. For example, chooses between its old theory and a new theory. That's the way it usually happens, according to Popper, and I guess according to most other people, right? You're usually choosing between an old established theory and a new one. But, but um, um, so, um, a theory, uh, that does explain that will be what Popper calls a theory of experience. This is, um, in, from section five, uh, page 16. That is chapter one, section five. On page 16 to 17, where the title is Experience as a Method. So experience, um, this is one of the places I was talking about when I said that even though Popper himself did the translation, it's, uh, it's still not really satisfactory. Um, so experience here translates the German word Erfahrung. This is um, like the word that Kant uses that's translated as experience. It's, I mean, experience is the right translation of it. Um, however, there's also another German term that also is correctly translated as experience, which is erlebnis. And this is actually a later term, like this term doesn't occur in um, it, it doesn't occur in any one of that time period. Um, 
but um, so, but power uses both of them and they both get translated as experience. So part of his point, um, and I, I have to think that he just decided that that couldn't be conveyed in English, but, um, Um, but the other use, the use of this other word is, for example, on page 21, where he says, um, talking about problems of the empirical basis. And he says that um, I shall have to deal with them since they have given rise to many obscurities. This is especially true of the relation between perceptual experiences and basic statements. So in that sense, on page 21, it's perceptual experiences translates or leaving this stuff. So then what's the difference between these two? Um, so, I mean, this one comes from foreign, which like in contemporary German means to drive, like to drive a car. <laughs> Ready, like Barfred Hugen used to be, I don't know if they still use that as a slogan, but Volkswagen used to use that as a slogan, right? Which means like enjoyment of driving. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, it's the kind of the English word fair, like when you say farewell, you know, like meaning it means to like go forth and like go somewhere, right? So, um, whereas this one comes from Leben, which means to live. Um, and so, like, basically, this is experience in the sense of, like, I experienced something. I had an experience. I lived through something. In a layman, the verb can mean to survive, right? Like, to survive a war or something. Um, so, um, whereas this is experienced in the sense of, um, like I'm experienced. <laughs> I had a lot of experience. This is something that happens to you, and this is something that you do. So, um, so when in section five he says that a theory, a methodology of empirical science will be a method, will be a theory of experience means experience in the sense of like an active um, project of learning from the world. Something we go out and do to learn from the world. Whereas when he says perceptual experiences in section, section seven, he's talking about things that happen to us Right, we experience certain sensations because of the way objects affect us, things like that, right? So, um, um, and so, like, one point he's going to make later on is that these uh, experiences in this sense can't justify any statement. This is just something that happened. It doesn't have logical implications. Um, or I think another way of putting the same, right? Whereas um, this is a process of testing statements somehow. And it does the closest thing we have to justifying statements, that is testing them and seeing if they survive with us. Yeah. So is the relatedness more like an anecdote or like an anecdotal experience that you can really use as like the basis of research? Whereas the other version is like testable? I think, you know, it's really just to, I mean, we do, So it's more, yeah, it's like, again, it's like experience is something you live through versus experience is something you do. Mm -hmm. It's not like two different kinds of experiences, it's two different meanings of the word experience. 
Um, which, you know, I mean, and we only have one word for both of them in English, which is why, like, as I said, I think Popper uh, just gave up on trying to represent this difference in English. By the way, in, in the alphabet, the term that Carnap used um, that was translated as I think, fundamental experiences or basic experiences, I forget, what it, but it's elementar elitnesa. So this is so his experiences in this sense. This, you know, so that that's why like Carnap fits into the picture that Carnap that Popper is going to draw of people who somehow think that what happens to me, that like the sensations that I personally have can justify some statements. Um, and you know, by saying the theory of empirical science is a theory of experience in this sense. He's he's basically taking Kant's side and saying that like um, no like objective reference to the world has to be active. It can't be passive. So um, and like so the the reason I go into that no I don't know maybe I'm just going into it partly because I like this but. <laughs> <laughs> Which and she said, well, we don't like it. But, uh, but no, but partly I'm going into it because, uh, because it does show that, I mean, look, with this book, not only are we back in the 30s, but we're back in Germany, right? Like at some point, Popper says, uh, I didn't write down what this was, but it says, from Hume via Kant to Russell and Whitehead. <laughs> right, like Kant disappeared from Hawaii's history of epistemology back in the middle. <laughs> so, and and I mean, I think this applies to Carnap and Popper. They just understand Kant differently, right? But the but, but this this discussion of experience and this understanding of of what it means and how it's different from this, even though, like I said, Kant himself doesn't use this term, but. Where he talks about the passivity of sense and whatever. So that um, this is uh, constitutes Popper's uh, interpretation of Kant, attempt to fit into some kind of Kantian tradition. So that's one reason to emphasize it. But another reason to emphasize it, aside from all the translation issues and so forth, is just that. So, you know, what experience means is an active way of learning from the world that's supposed to yield objective results that aren't just personal to me. Um, because how I'm affected by objects just, you know, uh, like, um, just depends on, on how they affected me. But, um, but experience is supposed to be something public. Um, um, it's based on principles we can all agree to. So therefore, you know, if the theory of experience of empirical science is proposing the rules of a kind of game, which Popper says, right? It's nevertheless, it's 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 it's, it's a game with a really serious objective. <laughs> right? Like the objective of this game is is objectivity. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, uh, um, so a lot is at stake potentially in getting these rules right. If, if this is what really we're, we're, this is really what we're talking about. Um, so, um, and the rules we're trying to get right again are the rules that we're going to say constitute empirical science. So we're going to answer the methodological question, what is the method of empirical science? And now we, like, we understand that that question is going to mean, what is the method of a human activity that can rationally learn from the world? But at the same time, it's also supposed to be the question, what is the specific institution that we have modern science? How does it work? Where did it come from? Why is it not philosophy, et cetera? Um, um, and um, so the answer to that is the, 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 the proposed methodology we come up with is going to be like um, 
in some sense, just like instructions to any rational creature about what to do. <laughs> but in another sense, it's going to be the answer to the demarcation problem. The demarcation problem being like, okay, which of the things we do count are empirical science and which are not? And I get, I mean, I don't know. I feel like I could have ordered this in a clearer way. But so, so, so it's like saying that the answer to this question is is serious because the the, the problem we're setting here is serious. It's like saying. Um, When we're asking which things are empirical science and which are not, we're trying to ask which are the which are like rational ways of learning from the world and which are not. Um, so um, I think I talked about this a little bit last time, but before I go into the details of the, I mean, I, so. Well, okay, so before I go into the details of the answer to the question, I'm just going to say briefly what the demarcation is supposed to be between. And so, like, what, what things Popper thinks will end up inside the, the line of demarcation, right? So, definitely in here goes science, meaning I know someone asked last time about what about social science or whatever. Well, like, it's certainly at least physical science. And probably, I guess you could tell from his examples, probably life science also, right? Social science, I think, is less clear, but I think I think he thinks so. Like, um, so first of all, the, for, for Carnap and the Alphabet, the answer was definitely social science, and not only social science, but art criticism, and right? Remember, like everything. There was it all meaningful was supposed to, to fit into the constructional system. Um, so Popper is already, I think, more a lot more restricted than that. He's, you know, like social science, let alone art criticism, are going to be the best borderline cases. I mean, he may say something like, uh, and we'll see uh, Kuhn also using this terminology, talking about mature sciences. So that implies that other things are that are kind of like science are immature, like, but that in the future they might become mature sciences. <laughs> That's the way a lot of these people think about social science, for example. Um, but okay, so leaving that aside, what else goes in here? Well, so this is important, I think, that um, Popper, for Popper, engineering definitely goes inside this circle. And the reason it's important, I think, to emphasize that is because we'll see that Kuhn is also, in effect, trying to, to answer the demarcation problem. But for Kuhn, engineering goes outside the circle. <laughs> right? Like, one of the things Kuhn is going to say is that, like, um, when a scientific problem becomes uh, too easy to solve, and we're only solving it because of some use we have for the answer. Scientists are no longer interested in it. They'll say, "Oh, that's you know, that's engineering." <laughs> Whereas for Popper, you know, people who are trying to get things to work in the world are are clearly an example of this same kind of experience that he's talking about. Um, so those are the things that go inside the circle. And then outside the circle goes, well, first of all, we know methodology, which is what Popper himself is doing in this book. So, I mean, and this is important, right? Because Popper definitely thinks what he's doing is rational and meaningful. He doesn't think it's irrational or not, let alone that it's nonsense. But it's not a rational way of learning from the world. It's something else. It's not empirical. In fact, it's not theoretical at all. It's practical, right? He's proposing conventions or something like that. Um, so, um, and that also, I mean, Popper emphasizes that a lot in his starred notes and whatever, that 
the myth that this demarcation problem was supposed to be a line between meaningless and meaningful. That, you know, that, that people falsely attributed to him the same project that people like Carnap were involved in. Said, oh, he's trying to draw a line between science and everything else. He must think everything else is meaningless. And that would mean that statements that are not falsifiable are meaningless. But Popper says, no, I never said that. It's, this, this is meaningful and this is meaningful, only this is science and this isn't. <laughs> or this is empirical science and this isn't. Right? And it, like, again, so you can tell from the fact that he includes himself in what he's doing here and that he explicitly distanced himself from people who say, oh, you have to throw away, throw away the ladder, right? Like Wittgenstein. <laughs> that, that, no, he doesn't think that the stuff out here is meaningless and he doesn't think it's irrational and he doesn't think it's bad because he's doing it himself right but nevertheless he thinks this is really important <laughs> um so another thing that goes out here is logic and mathematics so like the in the circle people in general thinks that russell has shown that mathematics is part of logic Frege and Russell have shown that. So afterwards, a lot of problems were raised for that. But um, but Popper is taking that for granted. I don't know if he ever reconsidered that later. Question. Um, I guess also like he doesn't say anything about this. I, I mean, I guess also things like um, ethics and politics go out here because they're practical. I, I, I'm not, I mean, it's still important, and this is what he says in his political writings, it's still important that they be open to criticism in certain ways, but they're not exactly what the testing of the scientific theory is. But anyway, um, something that definitely goes out here again is metaphysics. But, Popper, um, but for Popper, metaphysics is not always something bad. So not only is it not meaningless, but at least I think um, this changes a little bit between the time when he wrote the book and the later time when he wrote the Star Footnotes. So when he wrote the book, at the time he wrote the book, he, he sometimes seems to use metaphysics in a derogatory way, even though it's not completely consistent with what you know his official position is on. I think later he became more adamant that there's nothing bad about metaphysics per se. So, so what is metaphysics? Metaphysics is like theoretical statements about the world that are, you know, not falsifiable, <laughs> not empirical. So Popper says, you know, I mean, it's true that, um, um, but but and importantly, they don't pretend to be. Right. I, I mean, I think this is something, even though they disagree about what goes in this spot that, that Carnap and Popper actually agree about, the problem is not things that are not science in general. It's things that are not science but pretend to be science. Right. So for Carnap, that's metaphysics, because metaphysics is, it pretends to have a theoretical content, but it doesn't. For Popper, that's metaphysics is not that because he thinks it does have a theoretical content, it's just not empirical. So, um, and he says, you know, metaphysics, although metaphysical doctrines have sometimes interfered with the progress of science, other times they've really helped. And he mentions it like metaphysical atomist views as having like helped science progress at a certain point. Um, so, um, right, I mean, like the statement, you know, there are part of, there are bodies that are so small that they're not divisible, it's not falsifiable. <laughs> but, um, um, you know, but somehow the fact that people believe that helped them um, um, propose theories about the world that were falsifiable and that turned out to be good, that turned out to survive those tests. Yeah, it kind of sounds to me like engineering. Is like a methodology of physical science, though. 
because like while things while engineering like obviously is like theoretically testable and like you can test um if like a bridge is going to collapse or not or something like that i feel like um they're using like the principles that are learned from the theoretical testing of physics so it kind of feels like just an extension of methodology well i mean yeah he says these have the same methodology Oh. Right. So, you know, he says an engineer trying to figure out what's wrong with the air conditioning system is using scientific methodology. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you know, is that like, Kuhn is right that there's big differences between scientists and engineers, you know, and they don't necessarily get along with each other that way. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, the, the scientists will say the engineers don't, you know, don't understand physics and they're not using right. And the physicists will, you know, the engineers will say that the physicists are uh, like just talking about useless theoretical issues that, that will never come up in real life and that they know how to really solve. So they're, they're both inside this line. He's not interested in that difference. Um, but yeah, right. Whereas none physics. So, you know, and, and some proper actually says, you know, some metaphysical beliefs may even be essential to science. And I think later on, he took that position more strongly. And he's right, like he took the position that, you, should, you know, that scientists have to believe that there is a true theory of the world, or that there's a way that the world actually is. Um, even though um, we'll never know that we have that theory. <laughs> Right. All we we'll know is that our that we haven't ruled out that we have that theory because the theory we have hasn't been falsified. <laughs> but still, he thinks it's 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 essential for for scientists to believe something like that. And then you know, but it's obviously it's rational for other reasons they haven't learned it empirically. Um, I mean, it's it's basically it's related to Kant's doctrine of rational faith, and I and I think Popper uh, is aware of that it's related to that. Um, so anyway, um, but then the last thing that goes outside is pseudoscience, and I know I mentioned this before, this is the thing that Popper does think is bad, not meaningless still, but bad, right, we, we shouldn't have it. <laughs> and again, it's something that somehow like pretends to be empirical science, but, um, but has actually in one way or another, defended itself against falsification. So it's irrational. It's an irrational way of looking at the world. Um, Professor? Yeah. Um, um, the, the video, video is frozen, frozen yeah. on Zoom. Yeah. I don't know why that happens. But on we go. Okay. Um, so, okay, so, so this is the line we're trying to draw between the rational way of learning from the world and everything else. And, um, and it's really like, um, in the context of that problem that the proper is interested in the problem of induction or Green's problem. Problem of induction, she also calls Green's problem. And the reason it comes up in this context is because so we think we know what characterizes the things inside this circle and what characterizes the rational way of learning from the world. And we think the answer to both is induction. <laughs> we meaning a lot of people, right? <laughs> think that the answer to this must be induction. And then the problem is, but as Hume has shown, induction doesn't work. <laughs> um, so then we get this question, if we, if we admit that Hume is right and induction doesn't work, then we get the question, this is raised by um, Reichenbach, 
So Reichenbach was another associate of the Vienna Circle. He also was one of uh, Hilary Putnam's main teachers. He's quoted at the bottom of page four here. To illuminate it from, that is this principle, that is the principle of induction, determines the truth of scientific theories. To eliminate it from science would mean nothing less than to deprive science of the power to decide the truth or falsity of its theories. Without it, clearly, science would no longer have the right to distinguish its theories from the fanciful and arbitrary creations of the poet's mind. <laughs> right? So what Reichenbach is saying there is we don't know any way of demarcating science from other things other than the principle of induction, that scientists follow the principle of induction. Um, so we must find some way to justify the principle of induction. And of course, Popper is coming back and saying, no, Hume is right. There is no principle of induction. Induction doesn't work. He's going, that, that's, so in other words, Hume's problem, or like giving up on Hume's problem, as I guess Popper thinks Hume gave up on Hume's problem, giving up on Hume's problem lands you with what Popper calls Kant's problem, that is the demarcation problem. Because now, before, I mean, I guess you had it anyway, but you didn't worry about it because you thought everyone knew the answer to the, to the demarcation problem. But now you realize that Hume's problem is insoluble, and therefore induction can't be the answer. You're faced with, with what he calls Kant's problem. You might even agree with this. Is, why does he think that's Kant's main problem? Well, I don't know. Anyway, this is not, of course, about Kant, believe it or not. <laughs> you know, I keep talking about that. So, um, uh, right. So that you know that that makes Kant's problem, the problem of demarcation, urgent. So, um, so why? Um, why does Popper think that Hume's problem is insoluble? But is in what sense is there no solution? What is the problem? And in no, what sense is there no solution to the problem? So the problem, Popper says, is to derive universal statements from singular things. Is to derive universal statements from singular ones. So, um, So a sub part of this problem is, and that's the part we usually are worried about, I guess, is um, how to derive laws of nature from experiences, right? Because um, Bobber says a law of nature is always a universal statement. So, you know, a law of nature in general takes a form like this for all, for all X. And you know, Popper says X should be thought of as like a spatio-temporal location, basically. That's what values this variable is going to take on. For all X, if X is P, then X is Q. So this might mean like for all X, if there's a swarm at X, there's something white at X. Or as we would usually say, all swans are white. Um, so, right, so this is a universal uh, statement. And Popper says, on the other hand, statements of experience are always singular statements. Right? So statements like there's something here with a swan. I guess Popper uses the dot for him. So like this. The thing is, you know, the reason you use this to mean or is because it goes together with this to mean and. It's because like in a, you know, like in a, 
There's a structure called a Boolean lattice where you can put all the, the different. Uh, there we go. Anyway. <laughs> It's like and is the same thing as or just going the other direction in the tree of, of like propositions. But anyway, never mind that. So right, so this is a singular statement, which would mean there is something at x. Sorry, there is a swan at x, and there is something white at x. In other words, there's a white swan at x. And so um, a, an example of the problem of induction would be, okay, how can we derive a universal statement like this from singular statements like this? So, um, so the first thing is that Logically speaking, no finite list of singular statements like this can ever imply a empirical uh, universal statement like this. I mean, um, there's something not obvious about that. <laughs> So I guess like um, so that is uh, at least from a semantic way of thinking about logic. You can prove that if you um, are not allowed to assume that the domain is fine. Right, so if you're if you're not allowed to assume that there's only finite and many values that you can plug in for x, then I think it's going to be clear right away that you, that this can't imply that, right? That it can't that, that, that no finite sequence of these can imply that because it couldn't be true in, in every model where all those things are true. This is also true because there are always weakly other values for x that aren't under, I guess, actually, I shouldn't have written this with x. That's kind of what uh, should have said this. Right, there's, there's a swan at this particular place, A. <laughs> That's, and if there's something white at that particular place, A, right? And so you fill in a bunch of things like this when we change it A to B, C, D, whatever, right? But it can never be no matter, like there's always gonna be other values you can plug in for x that aren't on your list. Right, so um, at the time he wrote this book, he was thinking a more syntactic way, and I'm not sure that he thought the proof of this would be. But anyway, so um, so that means that if there's a principle by which we accept universal statements like this on the basis of singular statements like this, it can't be a logical or analytic principle. Do you have a question? Yeah, I guess I'm kind of wondering like how this would relate to like probability and statistics. Well, yeah. I guess if do you mean something like um I guess because like you could say, I don't know, like you wouldn't necessarily have to have, I guess, a universal statement that you think of something that's like probable, right? But then I guess that also wouldn't work if it was an infinite system. Well, I think, you know, so like usually the way probability comes in here, I'm not sure what you have in mind exactly. Usually people would say that the, the induction raises the probability of this universal statement. Right. So, I mean, um, uh, so Popper, so first of all, Popper points out that in Carnap's book on the um, fundamentals of probability, he actually ends up concluding that the probability of all universal statements is zero. <laughs> so, um, which, and then somehow tries to deal with that result. But, um, but assuming that, that there is a way to avoid that, you know, um, but uh, Popper will still say, well, you need some principle that, you know, um, 
that justifies you including from this to the probability statement. And that's going to run into the same problem. They won't be able to justify that principle. Yeah. So then the issue would lie in attempting to be to make a universal statement, and then we should just refer to specific statements. And like, if there is something that we would consider like a universal principle, we would just say that it applies to all specific situations, rather than saying it's just a law of nature. I well, so so I mean that's what. Um, um that's what Popper thinks positivists are pushed into saying. And he and, and he says that in effect that's what Carnet ends up saying at the end of that book on probabilities. And when we say something like this, we're really it's really just like a convenient shorthand for, for a bunch of finite statements. So I mean, like the problem with that is that um those universe you know, so-called universals that are really equivalent to a bunch of finite statements are like not testable everywhere and always, but only at those specific points. Mm -hmm. um, so if he thinks we should, we should, that's a bad proposal. You can propose to use these statements that way, but he thinks you should. Because we need the fact what, the, the reason we use these universal statements in science is, is, is precisely because they always go beyond our evidence and thereby expose us to risk. So if you make a proposal to understand them in such a way that they never go beyond our evidence, then uh, um, uh, you're saying things that can't be falsified, and, and therefore you're never you're not doing science anymore. <laughs> so um, right. So um, so anyway. So he says the principle of induction can't be a logical principle. The principle that allows us to get from these singular statements to universal statements can't be a logical principle. So um, well, could it be an empirical principle? So he says empirical principles on this view are principles that are justified by induction. So you can't justify the principle of induction by induction. Um, so, and I mean, yeah, I mean, you're laughing, Ryan, but the people, I think, as Papa points out, people have again and again tried to say something like this, right? That like the reason we should believe in induction is because it's it's you know shown its usefulness or something like that. And Popper says, well, it's shown its usefulness in the cases so far, but how do you know? What makes you think it will show its usefulness in any other cases? <laughs> so, um, so what else could it be if it's not um, logical? That is analytic, and it's not empirical, that is synthetic a posteriori in Kant's terminology. Well, so Popper says, this is why Kant tried to establish that there's something called synthetic a priori principles, right? Meaning principles that go beyond formal logic. They don't just tell you like how to avoid contradicting yourself, <laughs> but um, but we don't learn them from experience. We know them independently of experience. And, you know, like, again, whether that's a correct way of, of characterizing Kant or not is a little bit complicated. But, um, but that's, you know, I mean, it certainly makes sense in Popper's scheme anyway to put, to put Kant in that way. And all he says about that is that Kant's ingenious attempt to show this unfortunately failed. <laughs> So he doesn't explain why it failed. He just takes it. You'll agree with him that that is not a way of it. So if we cross off all three of those possibilities, it seems like there is no, there can't be a legitimate principle here. Um, So, well, I mean, 
that is, there can't be a legitimate theoretical principle here. And so Popper says, really, you have to regard this as a proposed methodology. The proposed methodology is to conclude when we have to, to accept universal statements. So, so this idea of accepting a theory is really important and yet a little bit unclear. I mean, it, it doesn't exactly mean believing it's true, although Popper says that as a psychological matter, we will believe it's true probably when we accept that. But, um, but that's not what acceptance as a, as a move in the game of science means. <laughs> acceptance means like that we like officially as the scientific community declare this to be the current theory or something like that. Um, so this is a proposal to do that in the face of certain kinds of evidence, even though there's no principle that requires us to do that. We can make that a, our convention. Um, so, but to that, Popper says, well, it's a bad proposed methodology for science. So, I mean, that's like, in a way, the, the, the idea that there's no solution to Hume's problem comes down to, um, I mean, because I, you know, I think Carnap would agree that there's no theoretical solution to this problem. That's a practical problem. So, like, in a way, it really, at least between Popper and Carnap, comes down to, um, uh, you know, should we want a solution to use problem? <laughs> so, um, and the, um, the reason I think that we shouldn't, according to Popper, is like what he understands is the motive behind that proposal. The motive behind that proposal is the idea that the point of getting evidence is to justify and defend our theories. So, like, we, we like this theory, we want to accept it, and so we go out and look for evidence that supports us. So we can hold on to it tighter. <laughs> and therefore, we make a proposal. Let's accept it officially when it gets a certain amount of evidence or something like that. So, I mean, so again, I guess this is coming back to something I keep emphasizing, but really the methodological, the overall methodological question comes first and precedes this issue, these logical issues of induction and so forth. It's really like we shouldn't want a convention like this because what we should be doing with our theories is um, like given that, I mean, I guess the point is that if there really were a principle of induction, and I guess Papa would say that means if Kant were right, uh, so I guess especially the second analogy is what he's thinking about, the law of cause and effect. Like, but anyway, whatever he's thinking of, if Kant were right, um, then uh, um, we would, we, like, there would be no choice about doing this, right? We would know a priori that this is what you should do. <laughs> but since Kant is not that, and the question is what to do in that situation, so this gets back to what I said before, what should you do in that situation where you're going to accept and psychologically speaking, believe certain theories, even though you have no legitimate theoretical principle that, that backs that up? Um, not look for a way to defend your theories more strongly. <laughs> not look for a way to justify your theories. On the contrary, theories are all too easily justified, so to speak. Right? That is, we all too easily treat them as justified, even though they're not. The question is, in the, the line between rational and irrational inter interaction with experience is like, um, have we at least set up ways to get us to stop believing a theory when it's wrong? <laughs> so therefore, you know, um, 
So in other words, the, the, the logical or theoretical argument about Hume's problem is not irrelevant, but given that there is no theoretical solution to Hume's problem, and then it just comes down to this practical question, Popper's uh, understanding of what is rational in this situation says, practically speaking, this is the wrong idea. So what's the right idea? And the right idea is that, um, well, uh, universal statements can't be implied by singular statements, but they do imply singular statements. Now, I mean, so if we had theories that looked like this, then the way they imply singular statements would be pretty obvious, right? Like, if it's true that, that there is an A everywhere, or that everywhere is A, then just put some place, say, you know, um, B, and, you know, this implies that. <laughs> there's an A everywhere, therefore there's an A at B. But, um, Obviously, there's a reason our theories don't look like this, and rather look like this. <laughs> now, I mean, and Popper doesn't go into the reason, and I'm not sure exactly how to, to, to go into the reason either, but, um, but you know, I mean, I mean, what we actually the theories we actually want to propose about the world are always theories of like what follows from what what properties go together if there really is a property that everything everywhere has then that's uninteresting <laughs> you know, there's no theory about that i mean you might even say that like we wouldn't know that property this is kind of like hume says like if every visual experience we've ever had was the same shade of purple. We wouldn't recognize that shade of purple as a problem. Yeah. Would the um the reason for like the conditional nature of how the theories have to involve is uh the notion of like North Rosen exhibition means like a initial initial conditions and type in uh, and natural law. So instead of like putting like why or, or it's definitely why right? that's a key Definitely x and x to p, you put y. If p y is true, then q x will be true. If p y is next condition, so I have p uh, b. And then if that is true, then q, 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 q x is true, I think. Well, this is related to what Popper calls initial conditions, but I think the relationship goes the other way. Because our theories are not like this, rather they're like this, the type of singular statements that our theories imply are like this. This is a singular statement. It says, if there's a swan in A, there's something white in A. Well, um, the key either to be a mixed condition for the swan being white, the swan being at A, B, but the swan, yeah, the swan being at, at that point, e, e, uh, the initial condition is the opposite. Right, yeah. So, I mean, and before going on further in this, but I'm not going to say a lot about this, but you know, I mean, so obviously we could define A to mean this, right? And then all of a sudden our theory would look like for all X, A, X. So it's not really about the, the like symbolic representation, right? It's really about the type of, it's, it's about like what type of statement we actually think of as a report of a singular event or what Popper calls basic statement. Right? So we think there's a swan here as a basic statement. Oh, sorry, there's a swan here as a basic statement. There's something white here as a basic statement. Um, you know, this predicate, which means this is like, this is not a basic statement. We won't, so I mean, uh, anyway, that, so that's what the issue really is. I, I think the first thing. So, so he's able to like kind of get around the problem of induction by saying that 
it's not necessarily things are necessarily predictive they're like implied by previous conditions like that there's a there's a guarantee that these conditions will lead to these conditions kind of so it, it kind of is deductive rather than inductive well it's, i mean there's two things it's deductive rather than inductive that means the implication goes this way from the universal to the singular mm -hmm. um but then because our theories are like this um the, the 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 universal law is not by itself going to imply any basic statement so it's not going to imply any like empirical report so to speak now the basic statements according to popper are not things like i see a brown thing in my visual field here now that they're they're public reportable events that's essential right because all of scientists have to be able to agree like what events happen so um but you know so they so so a basic statement might be like there's something white at a and so um universal laws like this imply basic statements like this only given some certain other basic statements like this and these are called the initial conditions Actually, in turn, it calls them boundary conditions, but for whatever reason, they decided to translate as initial conditions in English. I mean, it's, it's kind of equivalent, except boundary condition is more general. Uh, but right, so and this is the prediction. Um, And um, because the theory implies this basic statement given these initial conditions, um, it implies this, which is the same as um, The same as either there is not a spot at A um, or there is something white at A. <laughs> right? That's this is a general logical equivalence. Something implies something is the same as not something or right. So um, so that is um, if there isn't something white at A, then there must not be a spot. <laughs> Right. And so, um, so this again, like this, is not a basic statement because they're approval. But um, this is the negation of this. This is, this is called the Morgan's Law. But I mean, without getting into the No, wait, sorry. Uh, it's not true that there's a swan at A that's not white. And this part is a basic state, right? There's a non white swan at A. That's a possible right? um, empirical report. So I know this is probably confusing, but the reason I'm going, but I think it's more confusing if you don't realize this. So, so, so the situation is universal laws on their own don't imply any basic statements, but they do imply the negations of certain basic statements. So, so by the way, it's not true that the negation of a basic statement is a basic statement. Right, what I just said. Um, so, like, basic statement doesn't mean like you know statement that can be stated in terms of observational predicates or something like that. It means the kind of thing that can be used as a, as an empirical report by scientists, basically. And, and Popper says ultimately it's a matter of convention what we're going to allow and what we're not. It's what the scientists are willing to allow as an observational report.
But something like this is going to be in. Right? Someone tells me I saw a swan at position A and it wasn't left. And I might not believe them or you know, might worry about whether they feel like an illusion or whatever, but but the content of what they're saying is a perfectly good observational report. Um, if they come and, and say, well, I saw something at A that was either not a swan or white, that doesn't really tell me much. <laughs> That's yeah, the yeah. right? Because all it tells me is if there was a swan at A, it was right, right. But they didn't tell me if there's a, whether there's a swan at A or not, so they didn't really tell me what was at A at all. Right. So, um, so because the the universal law, um, even though it doesn't imply basic statements without initial conditions, does imply the negations of basic statements. There's an observational report you can make on its own that will falsify the theory. And I mean, again, you can like there's nothing mysterious. You can see how it works out in this case, right? So using the theory, I can't predict where there will be white things because I don't know where there are swans, right? Until someone tells me where there are swans, I can't predict where there are white things. But just so that I need the initial conditions to get predictions out of it. But I don't need any initial conditions to falsify. All I have to do is find some a uh, 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 swan that's not white. That's false. Okay. So that's the logical situation if we're into problem. Um, so the overall sleep, um, um I mean, I could go more into what these initial conditions are and how they really come up in science, but maybe that's not a good idea. Yeah. So then, uh, for Popper, at least, theories are best provable not by if you can like repeat them, but if you can negate them. I guess that's like the ultimate test of a theory. Yeah. Right. But that's that. So the answer to the demarcation problem is well. So again, it's a twofold answer. Right, but the kind of the proper kind of puts them in the wrong order as far as I can see. Right, like the the first answer is to the demarcation problem is empirical science is where people are trying to falsify universal theories about the world. They've accepted some universal theories and they're trying to falsify. It. They're trying to test it as severely as they can. Um, and if they're choosing between theories, they're going to choose the one that's su that survived the most severe test. Right. So um, um, that's uh, like that's the overall position. But then what that requires a certain logical structure to your theory. Right. That is, it has to have laws like this. And um, you know, this part and this part both have to uh, at least, you know, he says you start off with very universal laws. What does very universal mean? I, I mean, everything that's universal is universal, right? <laughs> but by very universal, he means like very far away from the basic statements. So they, they have these very abstract predicates, right? But you, you can deduce lower and lower level laws, and eventually you have to be able to get to laws where both the initial condition and the prediction are possible basic statements. And then if you have a theory that has consequences like this at the lowest level, it's a theory that if you use your method, if you adopt the right methodology, it will be falsifiable. So, like the, the, the solution to the logical problem is about the, the logical structure of the theory is a you know, solution to like what's the logical structure of the theory that's usable for the kind of methodology that I'm saying empirical science should have. 
Was that, did you have a question a long time ago that I haven't got to? Yeah, but now it's time to go with this Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry, a lot, a lot of stuff going on here. Let me have a shot. Yes? Oh, we're going to talk about like, um, the notion of like individual names, like now or later. You know, I, it depends how far I get today. It'll be now or later. <laughs> I not much of any layer, just later. Yeah, why don't you wait till you get to it? Because, uh, yeah, I mean, I actually, I did talk about it a little bit last time, but. Um, but I, I'll probably get back to it soon, actually. I think. So, I mean, so, so by the way, you know, also it should be clear from this that, um, um, that, so, okay, I guess I should step back and say, so the overall proposed methodology is this. Um, we, um, Wait to get an idea for a theory, who knows from where. <laughs> right, that part is passive. That part is like an irrelevance. Proper says it's, you know, uses the German verb einfall, which means like to occur to you, but literally means like to fall in, <laughs> right? Like, like at, at, at some point, a theory just like hits you. <laughs> So, but when the theory hits you, you check to make sure it has the right logical structure. If not, it's not usable as a scientific theory. Yeah. And it seems like something like um, um, John will get angry if you don't feed him. Then wouldn't that be falsifiable in the sense that yeah, if, it, if, um, if you don't feed him, he's, he's happy with it? Yeah, so, but it's only falsifiable if you know John. Right. So, like, you have to be there. This this has, and this is also probably related to what you want to ask about, right? This has to do with the thing is that I'm going to talk about soon, I hope, about the difference between strict universality and numerical universality, as he puts it. Or, I mean, in that case, it's not even numerical universality. Right, it just it, it just talks about John. So um, um, so uh, and I think to understand what he's saying about this, you have to always keep in mind that the, the methodological issue comes first, right? So like what we're looking for is theories that the whole community of scientists can like agree whether to accept or not. And can agree when they're falsified, and you know when they should be given up in favor of another theory, and so forth. So they have to be things that, like, um, uh, if you do a test in your lab, I can try to replicate it in my lab. So if John is like, if you don't feed John, he'll get angry. Is not like that because I have John and you don't. <laughs> like John is in my lab. And not in your lab. So, um, so I mean, you can call it falsifiable if you want, but it's not the right kind of falsifiable theory. And so that's why he says what we always really want in science is, is strictly universal theories. Um, that also will turn out have implications for how we should understand these properties, like Swan and White. I, I think I talked about this some last time, but I guess I'll, I'll try to get back to it this time. But, but you know, you have to understand swan as something that could be, there, there could in principle be a swan anywhere at any time. If you understand swan as like a particular population of animals on Earth that are descended from some particular ancestor, then um, this wouldn't be a good scientific theory, according to Bob. Um, which, I mean, 
before like you think that that's so implausible, I guess you have to keep in mind what I'm about to say, which is that of course scientists say lots of things besides the universal theory, right? For example, they give observation reports. They so Popper doesn't think that those are meaningless or useless or whatever, right? They're very important, but the theory has to have this form. So, you know, so like there exists a population of animals on earth descended from a certain ancestor and they're all white. With that whole thing put together is like basically a huge basic statement <laughs> from Popper's point of view. It could be used to, it could be predicted by a theory, it could be used to falsify a theory, but it's not itself a scientific theory. Um, okay. Are there any questions about that before I go on? Okay. So, um, right. So, I was about to say so, the proposed methodology is this a theory comes from you to you from somewhere. You check, and I guess I should say, you check if it can be interpreted as this kind of theory, right? Because again, it may depend how you understand what Swan means. Okay, right. so you, you check if, if you're able to understand it as this kind of theory. And if so, you start trying to test it. And, um, you know, so if it becomes falsified, so we'll discuss later, like, so falsifiability is a matter of just having consequences like this. So it's enough that there's just one consequence like this. Although there never is just one, because if you have a theory that's strictly universal like this, if there's one consequence like that, there'll be lots of them. Okay. But anyway, it's like enough for there to be just one consequence like this. And this is like a possible basic statement, right? We possibly could observe a non white swan, and that's enough to make the theory falsifiable. But when it comes to actually falsifying, Popper is going to say that just one report of one basic statement is not enough to, to make us count the theory as falsified. You're going to need, um, it, you know, something more than that to try to explain. So, because, you know, there's always stray observations that seem to go against the theory. But um, we don't really take them seriously unless they become replicable. It's basically the idea, right? So, um, so anyway, we have our theory. We try to falsify it. It becomes falsified. We don't accept it anymore. But we can also stop accepting it because we find a better theory. And the better theory could be um, a theory that has survived stricter tests than our theory, or it could be a theory that, in a sense, Popper is going to talk about later. It's like more testable than our theory. It says something stronger and also passes all the same tests as our old theory. So, like, then we have a choice. And, you know, by the way, like, we're talking about theories that actually occurred to someone, right? Like, again, we don't know. Popper says there's no methodology for coming up with theories. You just have to wait to get the idea. <laughs> Once they actually occurred to someone, you know, this is what we do. Um, and uh, so we accept the one that has actually passed severe tests. Now, so obviously, again, that only applies to the theory, right? Like, um, as far as like the, the basic statement goes, we can't have tests at all, right? We can't test every statement. So at some point, we have, just, we have to say, you know, someone says, there's a swan there, or there's something white there, or whatever, and we just, you know, take that as true. It's still testable, but we haven't tested it. So the theory has, that's accepted always has to have passed actual tests. But the other things that we use in science just have to be testable. And they don't have to be testable by everyone everywhere. They just have to be testable, you know, if you're there or whatever. Yeah. 
I conceptualize the um, the derivation by using the text like a like a quantifier negation. Would that be different from what you did? Or what? Well, I mean, any yeah. So I mean, you could instead write there's not existing place where you know we're not. That's yeah. that's that's equivalent to the law, and then you know. And then again, you can see why this would would falsify the thing. Like difference in the methodology, or it's only the private that doesn't matter. Well, it, it should like at least from Popper's point of view, it should like if we use logically equivalent statements of it, should not make a difference. So yeah, so it, so there's no, there is no difference. But it does there. You know, there is an advantage to writing in different ways that are equivalent to each other because they help you see different things about them. So the proper does talk about writing it this way, just as like it was useful to change this into this into that. <laughs> um, at least I have it useful. I don't know if that is. Um, yeah, so I mean, so yeah, so writing it this way helps you understand another way of looking at what universal lies. is. It forbids certain things. Yeah, as, as proper does it. Universal law on, on its own doesn't, uh, without initial conditions, doesn't predict anything, but it forbids certain things. Um, okay. Uh, I think it's actually, I've already gone into a lot of the stuff that's in the reading for today. It's come up by the way, or an answer to questions or whatever. So maybe things are not as bad as mm. yeah, basically I already went through the stuff about initial conditions. Right, so I think, um, yeah, so like I think I've already said, you know, like, so a big part of the point of chapter three is just to say what I've already set out here, right? That it, what a scientific theory is, it's a statement of universal, it's a system of universal statements. And by system, proper means, uh, again, that there's like some higher level ones that all the others can be deduced from. It. So it's axiomatized. Um, and, you know, it has, therefore, it has both the parts that Carnap says an axiomatic system has. It has axioms and it also has definitions. Um, so, and it's after like considering what's going on on the conceptual side. Or the constructional system side, um, as we, that uh, Popper has his main discussion of conventionalism. So, um, so again, I, I did, you know, because I was answering a question about it, I did kind of go through this before, but um, I'm going to talk about it more systematically, I guess, that. You know, so you have, so, um, and by the way, so, so, so why, I mean, so we understand why the theory has to consist of like universal laws like this, but why does it have to be a system of universal laws where like there's a few axioms and you can deduce all the others from them? So um, I think Papa thinks that's actually very important. And the reason it's important is that we want to know exactly what theory we're accepting right now. So to know exactly what theory we're accepting right now, we don't want our theory to consist of a whole bunch of random universal laws. That's so that it becomes hard to keep track of what we're committed to, so to speak, like what it is we've accepted. 
because if if that happens, then you know what we get. Uh, um, um, a basic statement that might seem falsifying. We're going to be tempted to just that kind of like shifts what we include in the theory and what we don't. It deals with it that. Way. So, um, so, so I think Popper's idea that a scientific theory in principle should be completely systematic and axiomatized comes from the same methodological concerns that he has everywhere else. It's like, ideally, we want a theory that where it's really easy to tell what the consequences of the theory are. And that will be easiest if it's still actually not that necessarily that easy, right? Like, if you had an axiomatized version of quantum chromodynamics, you would probably still have a hard time deriving even a single prediction from it. <laughs> so, but, um, um, but in any case, leaving that aside, it's going to be easier, right? If we have a few simple axioms that, that everything that's a consequence of the theory somehow has to follow from those. So he says, like, in practice, we don't usually arrive at that, but we but scientists strive towards that. Whether that's true or not is a description of what scientists do. Is it, Actually, this is something from Karnap that in his intellectual autobiography, he mentions that you know, when he was at Princeton, he was talking to some physicists there and they asked him what he was working on, and he, and he said he was working on it, axiomatizing general relativity, which was one of his one of his projects. And uh, the physicist said, in physics, there are no axioms. <laughs> And Karnap says this just shows to just serves to show the great distance and viewpoints that there are between different people or something like that. Yeah. So so Popper seeks to like provide like a methodology for empirical science, where Karnap just seeks to justify already um, arrived at scientific claims, or 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 is that the same goal in that sense? Well, I I mean Popper's version of Carnap is that Carnap will end up having to just de to just defend the existing scientific theories. You know, I mean, I don't think that's certainly not, not what Carnap says that he wants to do. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of like a proper side description of the difference. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, but, but, but there is this, there is this amount of truth to it that as I kept pointing out, the Aufbaus system is not usable for, um, for, like, it's usable for distinguishing between what kind of calls metaphysics and science. Because the people who are doing metaphysics, it's kind of like the exact thing that's good from Popper's point of view is bad from Karnas point of view. The people who are doing metaphysics admit that they're what they're doing has no empirical consequences. Right? So Karnap's system can rule them out because he can say, like, okay, we're trying to fit everything into the system. We're not finished yet, but where do you think you might go? And they're gonna say, we won't go in that system. So they rule themselves out, right? But Carnap's system can't really be used to rule out pseudoscience, right? Because if the like if the astrologers say, oh yeah, sure enough, we fit in the system somewhere, then that just adds to Carnap's project, right? Like construct the like, concepts of astrology. <laughs> We may not know how to do that, but we don't know how to do that for art criticism either, right? So, like, um, uh, whereas on the other hand, for the, the same difference between them is what, from Popper's point of view, makes this okay because they, they admit they're not doing empirical science. <laughs> but this is bad because they're, they're trying to claim that they're empirical scientists, but they're not. 
So, um, so I mean, so it's true that that Carnap's criterion doesn't and isn't meant to do the job that Pontus is meant to do in in policing science. And conversely, that, that Popper's criterion is not meant to do what Carnap's is meant to do, right? Popper's criterion is not meant to overthrow metaphysics. And he says, I have no interest in overthrowing metaphysics. <laughs> in fact, I think a lot of metaphysics is good. So um, I'm sure there's more to say about that. Which I should be able to connect it back to the difference between arguing about concepts and arguing about statements. But uh, I mean, at least you can see that when like Popper's methodological criteria is not going to be able, you won't be able to state it to, to state it in terms of what um, concepts you should use. Right? Because we have like statements like, you know, it is raining here. Um, or is not right here. Um, so, like, if raining is a empirically meaningful concept, then this sentence is going to be okay according to current. But obviously, it's not falsifiable or testable in any way. Because it's automatically true. Right? I mean, as, assuming raining is uh, like by it is not raining here. I mean, like not it is raining here. Why am I why am I making that change? Just, I'm I'm just worried about the vagueness of raining, right? That like maybe there's an intermediate between raining and not raining. <laughs> No, sorry, I shouldn't have even brought that up. But, <laughs> but that's right that this that, that the law of excluded middle might not really apply. Right. But um, but, but anyway, so you understand like <laughs> the way the example is supposed to work. Um, is raining here or is not raining here? It's automatically true, it's not falsifiable, but it uses the same concept as it is raining here, which is a good basic statement. So, um, so that, so that, like the difference between what they're trying to do, which somehow translates into the difference between um, uh, the the different criteria they set up, is somehow reflected in the fact that one of them focuses on concepts and the other one focuses on statements. Um, sorry, what was I saying before? That was a good question. I think it's very. Oh, all right, okay, there's four minutes left. So as I predicted, I won't get to the end of what I want to talk about today. <laughs> but um, but so anyway, so we have this, so there's a reason we're supposed to have this systematic theory that has axioms at the top, and it, then it has lower level universal statements, and then at the bottom it has the lowest level universal statements and lowest universal level universal statements are like this where where you know these are possible predicates of, of basic statements um so like so that's the deductional system in Carnap's terminology or the doctrinal side in Klein's terminology and that's what Popper is mostly interested in Right, and then he's interested in you know how these from these you can deduce the negations of basic statements and so forth. But at the same time, there's also you know what concepts are we going to use to to state these axioms? Well, probably not these easily observable things like swan and white that we would use in observation statements. Right, probably it's going to be stuff like field strength and you know particle mass and you know charge and stuff like that. Right, so um, it's um, um, so how is the conceptual side going to work? 
So like in, in the alpha system, the conceptual side works the same way the deductive side works. We have base, the axioms contain the basic concepts and all the other concepts are defined in terms of the basic concepts. But Popper says um, that um, Get into this. Um, well, okay, I, I guess I mean so the the reason that the conceptual side of it and the doctrinal side can go in the same direction in the alpha is that the basic concepts are supposed to be the concepts that are closest to our own experience. Um, and then the direction of the deductive system is going to be inductive, right? State, starting from specific statements of my experience up to higher level, you know, like statements about the world and generalizations and so forth. But since here the direction, it's the opposite direction. We start with these really high level general statements about the world, and then we get down, and eventually we want to get the statements that are close to experience. Um, these are the things that we, so to speak, like already most know what they mean. Like swan, white. So, um, so the so the conceptual side is going to go the other way. That's the thought. So these like most universal terms are going to have to be somehow defined in terms of less universal terms. Um, wait, is that even right now? I think I just said something wrong. All right, I have no time left to correct it. So I'll, I'll talk to you about it next time. I don't know why that happens. But on we go. Okay. Um, So, okay, so, so this is the line we're trying to draw between rational way of learning from the world and everything else. And, um, and it's really like um, in the context of that problem that the proper is interested in the problem of induction or Green's problem. Problem of induction, which she also calls Green's problem. And the reason it comes up in this context is because, so we think we know what characterizes the things inside the circle and what characterizes the rational way of learning from the world. And we think the answer to both is induction. <laughs> we meaning a lot of people, right? <laughs> think that the answer to this must be induction. And then the problem is, but as Hume has shown, induction doesn't work. <laughs> um, so then we get this question: if we if we admit that Hume is right and induction doesn't work. Then we get the question, this is raised by um, Reichenbach. So Reichenbach was another associate of the Vienna Circle. He also was one of uh, Hilary Putnam's main teachers. He's quoted at the bottom of page four here. To eliminate it from, that is this principle, that is the principle of induction, 
determines the truth of scientific theories. To eliminate it from science would mean nothing less than to deprive science of the power to decide the truth or falsity of its theories. Without it, clearly, science would no longer have the right to distinguish its theories from the fanciful and arbitrary creations of the poet's mind. <laughs> Right, so what Reichenbach is saying there is we don't know any way of demarcating science from other things other than the principle of induction, that scientists follow the principle of induction. Um, so we must find some way to justify the principle of induction. And of course, Popper is coming back and saying, no, Hume is right. There is no principle of induction. Induction doesn't work. Is going so that that's so in other words Hume's problem or like giving up on Hume's problem as I guess Popper thinks Hume gave up on Hume's problem giving up on Hume's problem lands you with what Popper calls Kant's problem that is the demarcation problem because now before I mean I guess you had it anyway but you didn't worry about it because you thought everyone knew the answer to the, to the demarcation problem but now you realize that Hume's problem is insoluble, and therefore induction can't be the answer. You're faced with, with what he calls Kant's problem. Do I even agree with this? Is, why does he think that's Kant's main problem? No, I don't know. Anyway, this is not, of course, about Kant, believe it or not. <laughs> you know, I keep talking about Kant. So, um, uh, right, so that, you know, that, that makes Kant's problem, the problem of demarcation, urgent. So, um, so why, um, why does Popper think that Hume's problem is insoluble? But is in what sense is there no solution? What is the problem, and in no, what sense is there no solution to the problem? So the problem, Popper says, is to derive universal statements from singular things. Um, deduction is to derive universal Statements from singular ones. So, um, so a sub part of this problem is, and that's the part we usually are worried about, I guess, is um, how to derive the laws of nature from experiences. Right, because um, Popper says a law of nature is always a universal statement. So, you know, a law of nature in general takes a form like this for all, for all X. And, you know, Popper says X should be thought of as like a spatial temporal location. That's what values this variable is going to take on. For all x, if x is p, then x is q. So this might mean like for all x, if there's a swarm at x, there's something white at x. Or as we would usually say, all swarms are white. Um, so right, so this is a universal uh, statement, and Popper says, on the other hand, statements of experience are always singular statements. Right, so statements like there's something here, it's a swamp. I guess Popper uses the dot for him. So, like this. See, the thing is, you know, the reason you use this to mean or is because it goes together with this to mean and. It's because, like, in a, you know, like, <laughs> like in a, there's a structure called a Boolean lattice where you can put all the different. Uh, no. anyway. <laughs> it's, it's like and is the same thing as or, just going the other direction in 
the tree of, of life's propositions. But anyway, never mind that. So, right, so this is a singular statement, which would mean there is something at X, sorry, there is a swan at X, and there is something white at X. In other words, there's a white swan at X. And so um, a, an example of the problem of induction would be, okay, how can we derive a universal statement like this from singular statements like this? So, um, so the first thing is that logically speaking, no finite list of singular statements like this can ever imply a empirical uh, universal statement like this. I mean, um, there's something not obvious about that. <laughs> So I guess like um, so that is uh, at least from a semantic way of thinking about logic. You can prove that if you um, are not allowed to assume that the domain is fine. Right, so if you're if you're not allowed to assume that there's only finite and many values that you plug in for x, then I think it's going to be clear right away that you, that this can't imply that, right? That is, it can't that, that, that no finite sequence of these can imply that because it couldn't be true in, in every model where all those things are true. This is also true because there always be other values for x that aren't under, I guess, actually, I shouldn't have written this with x. That's kind of confusing. Uh, should have said this, right? There's, there's a swan at this particular place, A. <laughs> That's, and if there's something white at that particular place, A, right? So you fill in a bunch of things like this when we change it A to B, C, D, whatever, right? But it can never be no matter, like there's always going to be other values you can plug in for x that aren't on your list. Right, so um, at the time he wrote this book, he was thinking a more syntactic way, and I'm not sure that he thought the proof of this would be. But anyway, so um, so that means that if there's a principle by which we accept universal statements like this on the basis of singular statements like this, it can't be a logical or analytic principle. Do you have a question? Yeah, I guess I'm kind of wondering like how this would relate to like probability and statistics. Well, yeah. I guess if do you mean something like um I guess because like you could say, I don't know, like you wouldn't necessarily have to have, I guess, a universal statement that you think of something that's like probable, right? But then I guess that also wouldn't work if it was an infinite system. Well, I think, you know, so like usually the way probability comes in here, I'm not sure what you have in mind exactly. Usually people would say that the, the induction raises the probability of this universal statement. Right. So, I mean, um, uh, so Popper, so first of all, Popper points out that in Carnap's book, um, the um, fundamentals of probability, he actually ends up concluding that the probability of all universal statements is zero. <laughs> so, um, which, and then somehow tries to deal with that result. But, um, but assuming that, that there is a way to avoid that, you know, um, but uh, Popper will still say, well, you need some principle that, you know, um, that justifies you in concluding from this to the probability statement. And that's going to run into the same problem that you won't be able to justify that principle. Yeah. So then the issue would lie in attempting to be, to make a universal statement and that we should just 
refer to specific statements. And like, if there's something that we would consider like a universal principle, we would just say that it applies to all specific situations rather than saying it's just a law of nature. I, well, so, so, I mean, that's what, um, um, that's what Popper thinks positivists are pushed into saying. And he and, and he says that in effect, that's what Carnap ends up saying at the end of that book on probability. Then when we say something like this, we're really, it's really just like a convenient shorthand for, for a bunch of finite statements. So, I mean, like the problem with that is that um, those universe, you know, so-called universals that are really equivalent to a bunch of finite statements are like not testable everywhere and always, but only at those specific points. Oh, um, so he thinks we should, we should, that's a bad proposal. You can propose to use these statements that way, but he thinks you should. Because we need the fact, what, the, the reason we use these universal statements in science is, is is precisely because they always go beyond our evidence and thereby expose us to risk. So if you make a proposal to understand them in such a way that they never go beyond our evidence, then uh, um, uh, you're saying things that can't be falsified and, and therefore you're, never, you're not doing empirical science anymore. <laughs> so, um, right, so, um, so anyway, so he says the principle of induction can't be a logical principle. The principle that allows us to get from these singular statements, the universal statements, can't be a logical principle. So, um, well, could it be an empirical principle? So he says empirical principles on this view are principles that are justified by induction. So you can't justify the principle of induction by induction. Um, so, and I mean, yeah, I mean, you're laughing, Ryan, but the people, I think, as Popper points out, people have again and again tried to say something like this, right? That like the reason we should believe in induction is because it's it's you know shown its usefulness or something like that. And Popper says, well, it's shown its usefulness in the cases so far, but how do you know? What makes you think it will show its usefulness in any other cases? <laughs> so, um, so what else could it be if it's not um, logical? That is analytic, and it's not empirical, that is synthetic a posteriori in Kant's terminology. Well, so Popper says, this is why Kant tried to establish that there's something called synthetic a priori principles, right? Meaning principles that go beyond formal logic. They don't just tell you like how to avoid contradicting yourself, <laughs> but um, but we don't learn them from experience. We know them independently of experience. And, you know, like, again, whether that's a correct way of, of characterizing Kant or not is a little bit complicated, but, um, but that's, you know, I mean, it certainly makes sense in Popper's scheme anyway, but to put Kant in that way. And all he says about that is that Kant's ingenious attempt to show this unfortunately failed. <laughs> So he doesn't explain why it fails. He just takes it. You'll agree with him that that is not a way out. So if we cross off all three of those possibilities, it seems like there is no, there can't be a legitimate principle here. Um, So, well, I mean, that is, there can't be a legitimate theoretical principle here. And so Popper says, really, you have to regard this as a proposed methodology. The proposed methodology is 
to conclude when we have to, to accept universal statements. So, so this idea of accepting a theory is really important and yet a little bit unclear. I mean, it, it doesn't exactly mean believing it's true, although Hopper says that as a psychological matter, we will believe it's true probably when we accept that. But, um, but that's not what acceptance as a, as a move in the game of science means. <laughs> acceptance means like that we like officially as the scientific community declare this to be the current theory or something like that. Um, so this is a proposal to do that in the face of certain kinds of evidence, even though there's no principle that requires us to do that. We can make that a, our convention. Um, so, but to that, Popper says, well, it's a bad proposed methodology for science. So, I mean, that's like, in a way, the, the, the idea that there's no solution to Hume's problem comes down to, um, I mean, because I, you know, I think Carnap would agree that there's no theoretical solution to this problem. That's a practical problem. So, like, in a way, it really, at least between Popper and Carnap, comes down to, um, uh, you know, should we want a solution to use from <laughs> so um and the um the reason i think that we shouldn't according to popper is like what he understands is the motive behind that proposal the motive behind that proposal is the idea that the point of getting evidence is to justify and defend our theory so, like, we, we like this theory, we want to accept it, and so we go out and look for evidence that supports us. So we can hold on to it tighter. <laughs> and therefore, we make a proposal, let's accept it officially when it gets a certain amount of evidence or something like that. So, I mean, so again, I guess this is coming back to something I keep emphasizing, but really the methodological, the overall methodological question comes first and precedes this issue, these logical issues about induction and so forth. It's really like, we shouldn't want a convention like this because what we should be doing with our theories is um, like given that, I mean, I guess the point is that if there really were a principle of induction, and I guess Papa would say that means if Kant were right, uh, I guess especially the second analogy is what he's thinking of, with law of cause and effect. Like, but anyway, whatever he's thinking of, if Kant were right, um, then uh, um, we would, like, there would be no choice about doing this, right? We would know a priori that this is what you should do. <laughs> but since Kant is not right, and the question is what to do in that situation. So this gets back to what I said before. What should you do in that situation where you're going to accept and psychologically speaking, believe certain theories, even though you have no legitimate theoretical principle that, that backs that up? Um, not look for a way to defend your theories more strongly. <laughs> not look for a way to justify your theories. On the contrary, Theories are all too easily justified, so to speak. Right? That is, we all too easily treat them as justified, even though they're not. The question is, in the, the line between rational and irrational inter interaction with experience is like, um, have we at least set up ways to get us to stop believing a theory when it's wrong? <laughs> So therefore, you know, um, so in other words, the, the, the logical or theoretical argument about Hume's problem is not irrelevant, but given that there is no theoretical solution to Hume's problem, and then it just comes down to this practical question, Popper's 
understanding of what is rational in this situation says, practically speaking, this is the wrong idea. So what's the right idea? And the right idea is that, um, well, uh, universal statements can't be implied by singular statements, but they do imply singular statements. Now, I mean, so if we had theories that looked like this, then the way they imply singular statements would be pretty obvious, right? Like if it's true that, that there is an A everywhere or that everywhere is A, then just click someplace, say, you know, um, B and, you know, this implies that <laughs> there's an A everywhere, therefore there's an A at B. But, um, Obviously, there's a reason our theories don't look like this, and rather look like this. <laughs> now, I mean, and Popper doesn't go into the reason, and I'm not sure exactly how to, to, to go into the reason either, but, um, but you know, I mean, I mean, What we actually, the theories we actually want to propose about the world are always theories of like what follows from what, what properties go together. If there really is a property that everything everywhere has, then that's uninteresting. <laughs> you know, there's no theory about that. I mean, you might even say that like we wouldn't know that property. This is kind of like Hume says, like if every visual experience we've ever had was the same shade of purple. We wouldn't recognize that shade of purple as a problem. Yeah. Would the um the reason for like the conditional nature of how the theories have involved his uh his notion of like North Russian exhibition means like a initial initial conditions and in, in, uh, in natural law. So instead of like putting like why or, or it's definitely why right? that's a key Definitely x and x to p, you put y. If p y is true, then qx will be true. If p y is an extra condition, so I'll have p uh, b. And then if that is true, then q, 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 q x is true, I think. Well, this is related to what Popper calls initial conditions, but I think the relationship goes the other way. Because our theories are not like this, rather they're like this, the type of singular statements that our theories imply are like this. This is a singular statement. It says, if there's a swan in A, there's something white in A. Well, um, it's easy to, to be uh, in this condition for the swan being white, the swan being at A, but the swan being, yeah, the swan being at, at that point, the, uh, the initial condition is the opposite. Right, yeah. So, I mean, and before going on further in this, but I'm not going to say a lot about this, but, you know, I mean, so obviously we could define A to mean this, right? And then all of a sudden our theory would look like for all X, A, X. So it's not really about the, the like symbolic representation, right? It's really about the type of, it's, it's about like what type of statement we actually think of as a report of a singular event or what Popper calls basic statement, right? So we think there's a swan here as a basic statement. Oh, sorry, there's a swan here as a basic statement. There's something white here as a basic statement. Um, you know, this, predicate, which means this is like, this is not a basic statement. We won't, so I mean, uh, anyway, that's, so that's what the issue really is. I, I think the first thing. So, so he's able to like kind of get around the problem of induction by saying that it's not necessarily, things are necessarily predictive, they're like implied by previous conditions, like that there's a, there's a guarantee that these conditions will lead to these conditions, kind of. So it, it kind of is deductive rather than 
Inductive? Well, I mean, there's two things. It's deductive rather than inductive. That means the implication goes this way, from the universal to the singular. Mm -hmm. um, but then because our theories are like this, um, the, 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 the universal law is not by itself going to imply any basic statement. So it's not going to imply any like empirical report, so to speak. Now, the basic statements, according to Popper, are not things like, I see a brown thing in my visual field here now. They're, they're public, reportable events. That's essential, right? Because all of scientists have to be able to agree, like, what events happen. So, um, but, you know, so, they, so, so a basic statement might be, like, there's something white at A. And so um, universal laws like this imply basic statements like this only given some certain other basic statements like this. And these are called the initial conditions. Actually, in turn, it calls them boundary conditions. But for whatever reason, they decided to translate as initial conditions in English. I mean, it's kind of equivalent, except boundary condition is more general. Uh, but, right, so, and this is the prediction. Um, and um, because the theory implies this basic statement, given these initial conditions, Um, it implies this, which is the same as um, the same as either there is not a spot at A um, or there is something white at A. Right, that's this is a general logical equivalence. Something implies something is the same as not something, or right. So, um, so that is, um, if there isn't something white at A, then there must not be a swan. <laughs> right, and so, um, so this again, like this, is not a basic statement because they're equivalent, but. Um, this is the negation of that argument. This. This is, this is called the Morgan's Law, actually. But I mean, but without getting into the uh, uh, no, wait, sorry. Uh, it's not true that there's a swan in A that's not what. And this part is a basic statement, right? There's a non-white swan in A. That's a possible right? um, empirical report. So I know this is probably confusing, but the reason I'm going, but I think it's more confusing if you don't realize this. So, so, so the situation is universal laws on their own don't imply any basic statements. So they do imply the negations of certain basic things. So, so by the way, it's not true that the negation of a basic statement is a basic statement. Honestly, right? <laughs> what I just said. Um, so, like, basic statement doesn't mean like you know statement that can be stated in terms of observational predicates or something like that. It means the kind of thing that can be used as, a, as an empirical report by scientists, basically. And, and Popper says ultimately it's a matter of a convention what we're going to allow and what we're not. It's what the scientists are willing to allow as an observational report. But something like this is going to be in. Right? Someone tells me I saw a swan at position A and it wasn't left. 
And I might not believe them or, you know, I worry about whether they feel a delusion or whatever, but, but the content of what they're saying is a perfectly good observational report. Um, if they come and, and say, well, I saw something at A that was either not a swan or white, that doesn't really tell me much. <laughs> That's shit, yeah, shit, yeah. right? Because all it tells me is, if there was a swan of A, it was right, right. But they didn't tell me if there was a, whether there was a swan of A or not, so they didn't really tell me what was at A at all. Right, so, um, so because the, the universal law, um, even though it doesn't imply basic statements without initial conditions, does imply the negations of basic statements, there's an observational report you can make on its own that will falsify the theory. And I mean, again, you can like there's nothing mysterious. You can see how it works out in this case, right? So using the theory, I can't predict where there will be white things because I don't know where there are swans, right? Until someone tells me where there are swans, I can't predict where there are white things. But just so that I need the initial conditions to get predictions out of it. But I don't need any initial conditions to falsify. All I have to do is find some a uh, 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 swan that's not white, that's false. Okay, so that's the logical situation according to Popper. Um, so the overall sleep, um, um, I mean, I could go more into what these initial conditions are and how they really come up in science, but maybe that's not a good idea. Yeah. So then, uh, for Popper, at least, theories are best provable not by if you can like repeat them, but if you can negate them, I guess. That's like the ultimate test of a theory. Yeah, right. But that's that. So the answer to the demarcation problem is well, so again, it's a twofold answer. Right, the, the, the kind of, the proper kind of puts them in the wrong order as far as I can see, right? Like the, the first answer is to the demarcation problem is empirical sciences where people are trying to falsify universal theories about the world. They've accepted some universal theories and they're trying to falsify it. They're trying to test it as severely as they can. Um, and if they're choosing between theories, they're going to choose the one that, su that survived the most severe test. Right? So um, um, that's uh, like that's the overall position, but then what that requires a certain logical structure to your theory. Right? It, is, it has to have laws like this. And um, you know this part and this part both have to uh, at least you know he says you start off with very universal laws. What does very universal mean? It's, I mean everything that's universal is universal, right? <laughs> but by very universal, he means like very far away from the basic statements. So they, they have these very abstract predicates, right? But you, you can deduce lower and lower level laws, and eventually you have to be able to get to laws where both the initial condition and the prediction are possible basic statements. And then if you have a theory that has consequences like this at the lowest level, it's a theory that if you use your method, if you adopt the right methodology, will be falsifiable. So, like the 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 solution to the logical problem is about the the logical structure of the theory is a, is a solution to like what's the logical structure of the theory that's usable for the kind of methodology that I'm saying empirical science should have. Was there, did you have a question a long time ago that I haven't got to? Uh, yeah, but now it's time to go with this position. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. 
I'm sorry, a lot, a lot of stuff going on here. Yes. Oh, we're gonna talk about like um the notion of like individual names like now or like you know, I, it depends how far I get today. It'll either be now or later. <laughs> it's not much many later, just later. Yeah, why don't you wait till we get to it? Because uh, yeah, I mean, I actually I did talk about it a little bit last time, but um, but I, I'll probably get back to it soon. Actually, I think. So, I mean, so, so by the way, you know, also it should be clear from this that um, um, that so, okay, I guess I should step back and say, so the overall proposed methodology is this. Um, we um, Wait to get an idea for a theory, who knows from where. <laughs> right, that part is passive. That part is like an erlatedness. Proper says, you know, uses the German verb einfall, which means like to occur to you, but literally means like to fall in, <laughs> right? Like, like at, at, at some point, a theory just like hits you. <laughs> So, but when the theory hits you, you check to make sure it has the right logical structure. If not, it's not usable as a scientific theory. Yeah. And it seems like something like um, um, John will get angry if you don't feed him. Uh, <laughs> then wouldn't that be falsifiable in the sense that if you don't feed him, he's happy? Yeah, so, but it's only falsifiable if you know John. Right. So, like, you have to be there. This this has, and this is also probably related to what you want to ask about, right? This has to do with the thing is that I'm going to talk about soon, I hope, about the difference between strict universality and numerical universality, as he puts it. Or, I mean, in that case, it's not even numerical universality. Right, it just it, it just talks about John. So um, um, so uh, and I think to understand what he's saying about this, you have to always keep in mind that the, the methodological issue comes first, right? So like what we're looking for is theories that the whole community of scientists can like agree whether to accept or not. And can agree when they're falsified, and you know when they should be given up in favor of another theory, and so forth. So they have to be things that, like, um, uh, if you do a test in your lab, I can try to replicate it in my lab. So if John is like, if you don't feed John, he'll get angry. Is not like that because I have John and you don't. <laughs> like John is in my lab and not in your lab. So, um, so I mean, you can call it falsifiable if you want, but it's not the right kind of falsifiable theory. And so that's why he says what we always really want in science is, is strictly universal theories. Um, that also will turn out have implications for how we should understand these properties like Swan and White. I, I think I talked about this some last time. I guess I'll, I'll try to get back to it this time. But, but you know, you have to understand Swan as something that could be, there, there could in principle be a Swan anywhere at any time. If you understand Swan as like a particular population of animals on Earth that are descended from some particular ancestor, then um, this wouldn't be a good scientific theory, according to Bob. Um, which, I mean, before like you think that's so implausible, I guess you have to keep in mind what I'm about to say, which is that, of course, scientists say lots of things besides the universal theory. 
right? For example, they give observation reports. They, so Palmer doesn't think that those are meaningless or useless or whatever, right? They're very important, but the theory has to have this form. So, you know, so like there exists a population of animals on earth descended from a certain ancestor and they're all white. With that whole thing put together is like basically a huge basic statement <laughs> from Popper's point of view. It could be used to, it could be predicted by a theory, it could be used to falsify a theory, but it's not itself a scientific theory. Um, okay. Are there any questions about that before I go on? Okay. So, um, right. So, I was about to say so, the proposed methodology is this a theory comes from you to you from somewhere. You check, and I guess I should say, you check if it can be interpreted as this kind of theory, right? Because again, it may depend how you understand what Swan means. Okay, so you, you check if, if you're able to understand it as this kind of theory. And if so, you start trying to test it. And, um, you know, so if it becomes falsified, so we'll discuss later, like, so falsifiability is a matter of just having consequences like this. So it's enough that there's just one consequence like this. Although there never is just one, because if you have a theory that's strictly universal like this, if there's one consequence like that, there'll be lots of them. Okay. But anyway, it's like enough for there to be just one consequence like this. And this is like a possible basic statement, right? You possibly could observe a non-white swan, and that's enough to make the theory falsifiable. But when it comes to actually falsifying, Popper is going to say that just one report of one basic statement is not enough to, to make us count the theory as falsified. You're going to need, um, it, you know, something more than that to try to explain. So, because, you know, there's always stray observations that seem to go against theory. But um, we don't really take them seriously unless they become replicable. It's basically the idea, right? So, um, so anyway, we have our theory. We try to falsify it. It becomes falsified. We don't accept it anymore. But we can also stop accepting it because we find a better theory. And the better theory could be um, a theory that has survived stricter tests than our theory, or it could be a theory that, in a sense, Popper is going to talk about later. It's like more testable than our theory. It says something stronger and also passes all the same tests as our old theory. So, like, then we have a choice. And, you know, by the way, like, we're talking about theories that actually occurred to someone, right? Like, again, we don't know. Popper says there's no methodology for coming up with theories. You just have to wait to get the idea. <laughs> Once they actually occur to someone, you know, this is what we do. Um, and uh, so we accept the one that has actually passed severe tests. Now, so obviously, again, that only applies to the theory, right? Like, um, as far as like the, the basic statement goes, we can't have test at all, right? We can't test every statement. So at some point, we have just we have to say, you know, someone says. There's a swan there, or there's something white there, or whatever, and we just, you know, take that as true. It's still testable, but we haven't tested it. So the theory has, that's accepted always has to have passed actual tests. But the other things that we use in science just have to be testable. And they don't have to be testable by everyone everywhere. They just have to be testable, you know, if you're there or whatever. Yeah. I can centralize the um, the derivation by using the check like a like quantifier negation, but that'd be different from what you did. Well, I mean, any 
Yeah, so I mean, you could instead write there's not existing place where, you know, we're not. That's, yeah. that's, that's equivalent to the law. And then, you know, and then again, you can see why this would, would falsify the thing. Like difference in the methodology or it's only the private form of that. Well, it, it should, like, at least from Popper's point of view, it should, like, if we use logically equivalent statements of it, it should make a difference. So, yeah, so, it's, so there's no, there is no difference. But it does, there, you know, there is an advantage to writing in different ways that are equivalent to each other because they help you see different things about them. So, I mean, Popper does talk about writing it this way, just as, like, it was useful to change this into this into that. Um, at least I can't be useful. I don't think I'm that useful. Um, yeah, so I mean, so yeah, so writing it this way helps you understand another way of looking at what the universal law is. It forbids certain things. Yeah, as, as Popper puts it. The universal law on, on its own doesn't, uh, without initial conditions, doesn't predict anything, but it forbids certain things. Um, okay. Um, what time is it now? We get started on this stuff. Yes. Yeah. The thing is, actually, I've already gone into a lot of the stuff that's in the reading for today. It's come up, by the way, or in answer to questions or whatever. So maybe things are not as bad as we think. Mm. Yeah, basically, I already went through the stuff about initial conditions. Right, so I think, um, yeah, so like I think I've already said, you know, like, so a big part of the point of chapter three is just to say what I've already set out here, right? That it, what a scientific theory is, it's a statement of universal, it's a system of universal statements. And by system, proper means, uh, again, that there's like some higher level ones and that all the others can be deduced from it. So it's axiomatized. Um, and, you know, it has, therefore, it has both the parts that Carnap says an axiomatic system has. It has axioms and it also has definitions. Um, so, and it's after like considering what's going on on the conceptual side. Or the constructional system side, um, as it, that uh, Popper has his main discussion of conventionalism. So, um, so again, I, I did, you know, because I was answering a question about it, I did kind of go through this before, but um, I'm going to talk about it more systematically, I guess, that. You know, so you have so, um, and by the way, so 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 why? I mean, so we understand why the theory has to consist of like universal laws like this, but why does it have to be a system of universal laws where like there's a few axioms and you can deduce all the others from them? So um, I think Popper thinks that's actually very important. And the reason it's important is that we want to know exactly what theory we're accepting right now. So to know exactly what theory we're accepting right now, we don't want our theory to consist of a whole bunch of random universal laws. That is so that it becomes hard to keep track of what we're committed to, so to speak, like what it is we've accepted. Because if if that happens, then you know what we get. Uh, um, um, a basic statement that might seem falsifying, 
we're going to be tempted to just that kind of like shift what we include in the theory of what we don't and deal with it that way. So, um, so, so I think Popper's idea that a scientific theory in principle should be completely systematic and axiomatized comes from the same methodological concerns that he has everywhere else. It's like, ideally, we want a theory that where it's really easy to tell what the consequences of the theory are. And that will be easiest if it's still actually not that necessarily that easy, right? Like, if you had an axiomatized version of quantum thermodynamics, you would probably still have a hard time deriving even a single prediction from it. <laughs> So, but um, um, but in any case, leaving that aside, it's going to be easier, right? If we have a few simple axioms that that everything that's a consequence of the theory somehow has to follow from those. So he says, like in practice, we don't usually arrive at that, but we but scientists strive towards that. Whether that's true or not is a description of what scientists do is, is actually, this is something from Carnap, but in his intellectual autobiography, he mentions that, you know, when he was at Princeton, he was talking to some physicists there and they asked him what he was working on. And he, and he said he was working on it, axiomatizing general relativity, which was one of his, one of his projects. And uh, the physicist said, in physics, there are no axioms. <laughs> and Carnap says this just shows to just serves to show the like, great distance and viewpoints that there are between different people or something like that. Yeah. So so Popper seeks to like provide like a methodology for empirical science, but Carnap just seeks to justify already um, arrived at scientific claims or would already be that same goal in that sense. Well, I, I mean Popper's version of Carnap is that Carnap will end up having to just de to just defend the existing scientific theories. You know, I mean, I don't think that's certainly not, not what Carnap says that he wants to do. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of like a proper side description of what it is. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, but, but, but there is this, there is this amount of truth to it that as I kept pointing out, the Alphaus system is not usable for, um, for, like, it's usable for distinguishing between what kind of calls metaphysics and science. Because the people who are doing metaphysics, it's kind of like the exact thing that's good from Popper's point of view is bad from Carnap's point of view. The people who are doing metaphysics admit that they're what they're doing has no empirical consequences. Right? So Carnap's system can rule them out because he can say, like, okay, we're trying to fit everything into the system. We're not finished yet, but where do you think you might go? And they're gonna say, we won't go with that system. So they rule themselves out, right? But Carnap's system can't really be used to rule out pseudoscience, right? Because if the like if the astrologers say, oh yeah, sure enough, we fit in the system somewhere, then that just adds to Carnap's project, right? Like construct the concepts of astrology. <laughs> We may not know how to do that, but we don't know how to do that for art criticism either, right? So, like, um, um, whereas on the other hand, for the, the same difference between them is what, from Popper's point of view, makes this okay because they, they admit they're not doing empirical science. <laughs> but this is bad because they're, they're trying to claim that they're empirical scientists, but they're not. So, um, so I mean, so it's true that the Carnap's criterion doesn't and isn't meant to do the job that Popper's is meant to do in in policing science. 
And conversely, the, the Popper's criterion is not meant to do what Carnap's is meant to do, right? Popper's criterion is not meant to overthrow metaphysics. And he says, I have no interest in overthrowing metaphysics. <laughs> in fact, I think a lot of metaphysics is good. So, um, I'm sure there's more to say about that. Which I should be able to connect it back to the difference between arguing about concepts and arguing about statements. But uh, I mean, at least you can see that the like Popper's methodological criteria is not going to be able, you won't be able to state it to, to state it in terms of what um, concepts you should use, right? Because we have like statements like you know. It is raining here, um, or it is not raining here. So, like, if raining is a empirically meaningful concept, then this sentence is going to be okay according to current. But obviously, it's not falsifiable or testable in any way because it's automatically true. Right? I mean, assuming raining is uh, like why it is not raining here. I mean, like not it is raining here. Why am I why am I making that change? Just, I'm I'm just worried about the vagueness. Of raining, right? That like maybe there's an intermediate between raining and not raining. <laughs> no, sorry, I shouldn't have even brought that up. But <laughs> but that's right. That this that, that the law of excluded middle might not really apply. Right, but um, but but anyway. So you understand like <laughs> where the example is supposed to work. Um, is raining here or is not raining here? It's automatically true. It's not falsifiable. But it uses the same concept as it is raining here, which is a good basic state. So, um, so that so that like the difference between what they're trying to do, which somehow translates into the difference between um, uh, the the different criteria they set up, is somehow reflected in the fact that one of them focuses on concepts and the other one focuses on statements. Um, sorry, what were we saying before? That was a good question. I think it's very um, oh, all right. Okay, just one minute left. So, as I predicted, I won't get to the end of what I want to talk about today. <laughs> but, um, but so anyway, so we have this. So, there's a reason you're supposed to have this systematic theory that has axioms at the top, and it, then it has lower level. Universal statements, and then at the bottom it has the lowest level universal statements. And the lowest universal level universal statements are like this, where where you know these are possible predicates of, of basic statements. Um, so like so that's the deductional system in Carnap's terminology, or the doctrinal side in Klein's terminology, and that's what. Popper is mostly interested in, right? And then he's interested in, you know, how these, from these, you can deduce the negations of basic statements and so forth. But at the same time, there's also, you know, what concepts are we going to use to, to state these axioms? Well, probably not these easily observable things like swan and white that we would use in observation statements. Right, probably it's going to be stuff like field strength and you know particle mass and you know charge and stuff like that. Right, so um, it's um, um, so how is the conceptual side going to work? So, like in in the Alpha system, the conceptual Side works the same way the deductive side works. 
We have base, the axioms contain the basic concepts, and all the other concepts are defined in terms of the basic concepts. But Popper says um, that um, Get into this. Um, well, okay, I, I guess, I mean, so that the reason that the conceptual side of it and the doctrinal side can go in the same direction in the alpha is that the basic concepts are supposed to be the concepts that are closest to our own experience. Um, and then the direction of the deductive system is going to be inductive. Right, state, starting from specific statements of my experience up to higher level, you know, like statements about the world and generalizations and so forth. But since here the direction, it's the opposite direction. We start with these really high level general statements about the world, and then we get down and eventually we want to get the statements that are close to experience. Um, these are the things that we, so to speak, like already most know what they mean. Like swan and white. So um, so the so the conceptual side is going to go the other way. That's the thought. So these like most universal terms are going to have to be somehow defined in terms of less universal terms. Um, wait, is that even right now? I think I just said something wrong. All right, I have no time left to correct me. So I'll talk, I'll talk to you about it next time. Well,